we, representing the Aborigines of Australia, assembled in the conference at the Australian Hall, Sydney, on the 26th day of January, 1938. This being the 150th anniversary of the white man's seizure of our country. Hereby make protest against the callous treatment of our people by the white men during the past 150 years. And we appeal to the Australian nation of today to make new laws for the education and care of Aborigines. And we ask for a new policy which will raise our people to full citizen status and equality within the community. It was a simple call for equality, but when this declaration was first written almost a century ago, it was radical. The year was 1938, and on the 26th of January, Sydney was marking a milestone. And now they're all ready to see reenacted the landing of Captain Phillips, an event which took place 150 years ago today. But the festivities were lost on many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Aboriginal people were under severe control and restriction by the established state protection boards. Everyday decisions on your life, whether what you ate, what you wore, who you could marry, where you could go were restricted, heavily restricted. Amidst the celebrations, a small group dressed in black stood out from the crowd. They not only broke the laws that prevented them from gathering, but they actually stood in the main part of the colony to stand in opposition and or as a contrast to the celebration to declare it a day of mourning. After the parade had passed, around 100 people gathered in this building for one of the most significant but little-known civil rights protests of the 20th century. The site of what became known as the Day of Mourning protest is now owned by the Sydney Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. The power of what occurred here in 1938 continues to resonate certainly on myself and many others who are aware of what's took place here. The group called out the appalling living conditions on Aboriginal missions and reserves and demanded full citizenship and equality. You know, there were so many of them that turned up and they at great risk to themselves, you know, risking arrest. You know, these are Aborigines free roaming. Suzanne Ingram's grandmother, Louisa Ingram, was part of the protest and was captured in this iconic image. I just have a very distinct memory sitting on the couch in the lounge room and the photo was always there. Suzanne has fought to preserve the legacy of the quietly strong Wiradjuri woman widely known as Mrs Ingram. She had 11 children. My mother's the middle. My relationship with her was, was very close. I was very fortunate to have had her. Annie Drewitt's grandmother, Pearl Gibbs, helped organise the Day of Mourning protest. She describes her ancestor as a great communicator with a fighting spirit. If Aboriginal people were excluded from schools, from work health and safety, from hospitals, from the whole like, she was noticing that and that's what she was agitating for along with all the other protesters out there. Pearl Gibbs was later instrumental in the 1967 referendum, which saw Aboriginal people counted in the national census. So there's a, a stamina, there's a determinism, there's a, wow, how to make it better. What is really heartbreaking is that we're still here, 85 years later, having similar conversations. There's not enough people in this country, black or white, who really know their history. John Maynard has dedicated much of his life to preserving Aboriginal history, a career inspired by his grandfather, Fred Maynard. My grandfather, a young man, had travelled widely as a stockman, a timber getter, and seen the shocking conditions of Aboriginal people across the state. And this sort of, you know, percolated with him and eventually uh, saw it um, emerge as an organised political movement with a platform of seeking Aboriginal justice. Fred Maynard was not present at the day of mourning, 
but his work in the decades prior laid the groundwork for the protest to happen. In 1924, he founded the country's first politically organised Aboriginal activist group, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association. The group held its first civil rights conference the following year, which was hailed a success in local newspapers. They demanded that all the state protection boards be abolished and replaced by an all Aboriginal board to sit under the Commonwealth Government. That's a voice to Parliament nearly a hundred years before what they're talking about today. We stand on the shoulders of giants. It's in that very hall in 1938 that our people gathered. The sad thing about this day called January 26, 85 years later after the 1938 protests, is that we're still doing it. It's crazy. As another landmark referendum approaches, it remains to be seen whether the voice to parliament can answer long-standing calls for Aboriginal representation. The voice lacks credibility. I think it has a credibility problem. And not just with Australians generally, which is what I'm seeing, um, but absolutely with Aboriginal people. My grandmother was fighting for a voice back in 1938. So I feel quite confident that uh, yeah, she'd be out there protesting on the streets, making the speeches in the same way. I hope that I can honour her memory and her legacy by, by advocating for the same thing.